Nelson. I'm the Commissioner of the Maine Department of Labor and I'm joined by my colleague. Hi, I'm Kim Smith, Deputy <coughs> Commissioner. And um, welcome to our usual Friday afternoon briefing on unemployment uh, insurance. We'll give you a brief overview of um, a new program that is going to be happening, uh, give updates on some of the statistics, and um, we did not receive, I think we received one question today, so we will definitely cover that as part of our presentation. Uh, this is a legislative briefing. Legislators can either put questions in the chat box or unmute themselves to ask questions. Um, hopefully, once we've gone through just a, a, a few of the slides that we have to provide the overview. Uh, this is also live on Facebook, so we do know that other people are also watching. And we're hoping that the questions and the information that we provide are uh, relevant for that wider audience as well. So I think with that, we'll just jump into uh, some of the slides. So last week um, when we, uh, we met, we spent a little bit of time talking about the Lost Wages Assistance Program. And this is the um, funding that's available through the Federal Emergency Management Agency. The president had issued a presidential memoranda that outlined um, how this program could be used to provide uh, supplemental benefits to people who were receiving unemployment insurance. And we've, um, we are going to be applying for this lost wages assistance program. If we are approved for the program, uh, FEMA uh, is expected to give us roughly three weeks of benefits. And then after that, we would be um, requesting the funding on a week-by-week -week basis. Just as a recap, this pot of money is about $44 billion. It comes out of their disaster relief fund. And if uh, this program ends once the $44 billion have been spent, or if the federal um, disaster relief program drops to $25 billion in funding, or if Congress takes uh, some legislative action and passes a different program. So those are kind of the, the moving parts about the funding for the program. If every state in the country applies, uh, the estimate is that that $44 billion will last roughly five weeks. Um, we plan to submit our, our application early next week. Um, and uh, as we mentioned, we are not allowed to use any of the federal funds that we currently receive for unemployment insurance to go toward any of the staffing, IT, or other program costs of setting this program up. Uh, and we estimate that it'll take approximately um, three weeks in order to uh, get begin sending the benefits out um, once we've been approved for the program. So uh, the eligibility requirements <clears throat> are the, the people must be receiving unemployment benefits, and those benefits could either be state unemployment benefits or any of the federal programs, pandemic unemployment assistance or um, pandemic uh, emergency unemployment compensation. The, um, anyone, any eligible people also must have a weekly benefit of an amount of at least $100. There are roughly 1,200 people uh, currently, currently receiving benefits in Maine who drop below that $100 and they would not um, be eligible for this supplemental benefit. And um, we have checked and there is not um, a way for us to raise those people to $100 using any unemployment um, benefits that we currently have or using CARES Act funding. Um, we received very clear uh, rejections of those ideas. 
And also, in order to be eligible, the person needs to be unemployed or partially unemployed as a direct result of COVID-19. <clears throat> so once we receive the benefits, we will pay benefits um, retroactively. So for the week ending August 1st, so that means the week ending August 1st, August 8th, and August 15th are the benefit weeks that would be covered by that initial payment um, if we are um, approved for the program. Is there anything? Uh, the only thing I would add to that is we will process those payments automatically. There isn't anything additional that uh, people need to do in order to receive that $300. Right, because it's not a new eligibility. Right. It is something that is um, supplementing benefits that are already available and people are receiving. I think that's it. <clears throat> um, as a quick overview, <clears throat> we just wanted to let you know that as we have been since the beginning of the pandemic, which we um, mark as March 15th, um, that we are continuing to process an elevated level of claims. Uh, you know, as a last week, um, there were about an additional 3,000 people who received, who filed new initial claims last week. In a typical week in um, from for August for last year, I'm trying to remember, I think it was about 394 claims that we were processing at this time last year, and now it's roughly 3,000 claims a week. So 98% of all initial claimants have received a determination, so that's people who have filed between March 15th and August 19th. Um, and of those, about 88% have received a benefit payment. Um, about 7% are in, in, in an inactive status because they're not currently filing any weekly certifications. And about 3% of the claimants were determined to not be eligible. And since March 15th, about 134,000 people have received at least one benefit. So again, we're focused on um, our conversation today. I'll be focused on the remaining roughly 2% of claimants who um, we are still uh, working with. And that 2%, uh, it's not the same group of 2% of the people, um, that those numbers change. Uh, the, the number, the percentage hasn't changed, but the number of people coming in and out of that, that bucket of, um, of claimants does change on a weekly basis. Uh, we're continuing to use our expedited adjudication process to resolve fact-finding and, um, unfortunately, fraud detection continues to uh, take up um, a considerable amount of uh, our energy and focus. And uh, again, as an example, um, for the entire year of 2000, or the last year that, um, I want to say it was for 2015, that the last uh, federal numbers were given, Maine had roughly 1.9% of uh, fraudulent payments. And unfortunately, as you can see from these numbers here, Maine, like every other state in the country, is seeing a significant increase in, um, in fraudulent cases. Kim, do you want to take us through this slide? Sure. This um, breaks down the categories that the commissioner just talked about so you can see them graphically. So looking at the, the last column, you can see in the dark blue section there's 134,000 people roughly who have been paid. Uh, the 11,100 in, in the red uh, are those that are inactive. And as you can see, that number has held relatively even over the last seven weeks. Um, it, it did come down initially there at the uh, mid-July, but has been holding at just over 11,000 people. And these are folks who did file an initial claim, but haven't filed any weekly certifications. Uh, a lot of those individuals received uh, payroll protection program funds or continue to be paid in some other way from their employer. So they are at this point inactive. We have about 3,800 people who are ineligible for benefits. Uh, another roughly 400 that we have flagged as potentially fraudulent at the moment. And then the, the top section, about 2,900 people that are in process. And we can move to the next slide. We'll focus on those 2,900. 
It breaks down, as in past weeks, the bulk of them are, in this case, right now, 1,500 people roughly waiting for fact-finding. As the commissioner said earlier, we have uh, a SWAT team, if you will, working on those fact-findings, going through them from oldest to newest. Uh, just over 900 people have been determined to be ineligible for unemployment and are um, in the process of either filling out their application or waiting for us to, to finish the process of moving in into the PUA program. We have 128 people who are um, you know, here it says awaiting B1. This is the form that we send to employers to verify any separation um, information that's needed. Um, and then we have another 150 people who are in pending status. Pending status can mean usually we have a, the name doesn't match the Social Security number when we do the check with the Social Security Administration or there are a mismatch in what we have reported as wages for those individuals compared to what they have reported on their initial claim. So if we go to the next slide, this is a breakdown of the individuals who are waiting for fact-finding. We have just a few people from March, April, and May, 17 people in total, uh, 15 of those in May, uh, 141 people remaining from June, and then the rest are from July and August. Uh, and we are, again, having the dedicated team of adjudicators working through those um, to, to, make, to close out those fact findings. And as the commissioner, I think, said last week, it, it may be hard to ever say that March and April are closed out. Um, we would certainly like to think that, but it could be also somebody that filed their initial claim back in March, um, but then didn't, didn't file any of the weekly certifications and now have been separated from their employer again uh, today. So, their claim is dated March. That's how we are aging it. So that's how we're working it. Um, so it, we can clear out the March queue and then have somebody else pop back up, is what I'm trying to say. Okay. So um, we also wanted to, um, to talk a little bit about the reemployment services that we're offering. I think everyone. Um, Last week, we spent a significant amount of time going through work search uh, and talking about what those requirements are, looking at the screens, seeing what people would see, um, and uh, talking about how we had expanded some of the um, activities that were going to be considered as satisfying those work search activity requirements. Um, one question that we did receive this week was, and uh, if you looked at the weekly claims numbers that were released yesterday, you would have seen that weekly certifications were down. And the question was, is that due to the work search requirement? The numbers that were released yesterday were actually covering the week ending August 8th. <clears throat> so the work search requirements um, were not in place it was yet, but we will be looking at those numbers. Uh, another, those numbers will be released next week, right? So the weeks that are covered by the work search, right? So we have not that we do not believe is the uh, reason for that decline. And in fact, we think it probably has more to do with people going back to work. If you saw the um, the unemployment. Uh, numbers that were released today from our um, Center for Workforce Research and Information, you would have seen that there was an uptick in the uh, labor force participation rate that was fairly significant. And we think that we are seeing that trend. Um, it may be almost counterintuitive because the unemployment rate uh, went up as well. Um, we think that the current unemployment rate that was reported today is um, more uh, reflective of what uh, is actually happening in the uh, labor market. And part of that is that you're not counted in that unemployment rate if you are not uh, looking for work. You're not counted as unemployed uh, through that particular metric, which is designed by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, and that's a national um, definition that's used. It's consistently applied across all states. And actually, I would just add to that that it's not um, reporting that you're looking for work on your weekly certification. Right. The weekly certifications and the survey that the Bureau of Labor Statistics does is it's actually two separate things. So the unemployment rate 
is based on a survey of households, not on the weekly claims, weekly certifications that are submitted. Right. It's a household survey and payroll. So those are the two surveys that are used for the BLS uh, unemployment rate, not um, the claims numbers that are used. Claims numbers are really more of a production number. So um, one of the reasons we thought it was important to, again, talk about or begin to talk about some of the services that are available through um, the career centers is because we are seeing more people uh, going back to work, exploring work, and uh, wondering what their options are. Um, we have added an additional workshop. Um, we mentioned last week and the week before that there is a workshop available. It was available on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It's now Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And staff will um, work with people to help them understand how to put a profile together, how to get the best use out of their main job link account, and people can register for uh, those workshops by going to the maincareercenter.gov website. And this is just a quick update on a partnership that we announced last week. Um, we are partnering with Coursera. It's an online uh, learning program, and they have offered uh, five um, opportunities for up to 5,000 unemployed workers here in Maine, uh, giving them free access to 2,800 courses. It's part of a, an initiative that they put together called the Coursera Workforce Recovery Initiative, and they are providing these services on a worldwide basis to help unemployed workers uh, gain the skills that they need to become reemployed more quickly. The registration must occur by September 30th, and that um, and you need to have a job link account in order to be eligible for that. So again, another reason to participate in one of those um, workshops on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. And uh, also to just give you a, a uh, snapshot of what's happening, we're using the information that we have about people who have signed up on the job link to send out invitations. The career centers are also reaching out to people that they're working with from across the state. Uh, so far, we've invited 978 people to join. And of that, 535 have already joined and are taking advantage of the courses. Um, we've also done a crosswalk between some of the courses that are available and the jobs that are listed on the job bank. I think we have about 13,000 jobs available on the, on the job bank this week. The number of jobs being listed there continues to increase, and as well as the number of people who are um, filling out their profile and posting their resumes on the job bank. And this just gives you an idea of some of the most popular courses so far. Um, they're in business, um, a lot of uh, computer and business um, classes that people are signing up for, including things like data analysis and uh, project management. So again, this is just how you can um, get more information and register for these programs. Anyone who has an active account, MJL stands for Mean Job Link, um, anyone who has an active account will receive an invitation from the, the Career Center. Uh, staff in each of the Career Centers um, have been designated to do outreach to uh, the community and to help people understand how to sign up for these courses and what this opportunity is. And again, you must sign up for a class by September 30th and wrap up by the end of the year. Uh, so it's a time you know, sensitive opportunity. And we hope that we do reach the maximum number of 5,000 people taking advantage of this because it uh, seems like a valuable um, opportunity. Uh, for folks at this point in time. It is free, and um, we want anyone who is interested to be able to use it. So I think those are the slides that we have, and I see some questions.
stuff. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. sure which one you're starting. Yeah, I was I was I was looking at um, I was looking at Senator Bellow's question. If someone was getting the extended um, benefits, so they won't qualify for since unemployment's not related to COVID, and that's uh, anything that's not related to COVID, uh, that additional FEMA three hundred dollars would not cover. That's accurate, Senator. And what's the cost of course? Sarah, I can't read that, to the state of Maine, uh, nothing. It was offered to us for free. It's a free program um, for a time limited um, period. And it's been offered to other states as, um, as well as uh, countries from across the globe. Hi, Commissioner, this is Senator Millett. Um, my, my question actually, um, dovetails off of the Coursera work. Um, it's great that it's free um, and that the utilization is really high, but I, um, not but, and, I um, was on a recent call with the Maine community, Maine community College system. We recently funded um, some really great work on their end around um, workforce development employee training. I know that they've got a bunch of work that's go, um, looking at online learning and wondering if there's any sort of um, conversations that are happening between the department and the main community college system so we can leverage, I would, I would say their main, you know, their very strong main understanding of Maine's economic and, and employment needs. Sure, and Senator, I, I actually am an ad, ad hoc member of the Board of Trustees for the Community College. So uh, yeah, there is a regular conversation that happens in our Bureau of Employment Services and their workforce development folks do uh, talk to each other um, at least on a weekly basis, if not more frequently than that. This is in no way intended to supplant um, opportunities that are available at the community college this was a short-term free opportunity um, that could provide some targeted short-term training. We always work with, and the community college is also on the state workforce board, so there is a lot of collaboration and partnership and leveraging that happens. Can I, is it okay if I just ask a follow-up? Sure. Awesome, thank you. Um, are you aware of whether there's any um, funding that might be available to um, provide this, the, the main community college training, programming um, for no cost to folks that are um, part of the UI, um, the unemployment insurance program, the work search program? So there, when you're asking that question, I just want to make sure I understand it. Programs such as competitive skills scholarship program um, are people who are eligible. Um, uh, we have a number of training programs that are available through the Department of Labor that we help people uh, obtain training. And that is how um, we support the community college programs. Um, the Department of Labor does not have a chunk of money that go specifically to providers to provide um, training. So that's why this program worked for us because it wasn't, we, we didn't have to use uh, funding in order to offer this particular um, uh, kind of group service. The, um, the way that we provide funding is anyone who meets eligibility requirements uh, requirements as a dislocated worker or someone who fits the eligibility requirements for the competitive skills scholarship program would be matched to training opportunities that were high wage, high demand, and that they had the skills for, assuming that we had the resources. The resources are tied to individuals, not to um, like a, a grant to give to uh, a, uh, a particular program. 
but there are a list of eligible providers that someone, if an individual meets criteria and is eligible for training resources, there's a list of eligible providers that then that person could choose from. And the community college is definitely an eligible provider in the state of Maine. Great. So we're getting closer to the where I'm what I'm trying to figure out, which is um, is there so obviously the demand for that scholarship probably is pretty high given our current situation. And I'm wondering, is the is the amount of funding that we have available right now going to meet the need? If so, that's great. If not. Um, are, are there efforts underway to try to use maybe some of the CARES Act funding or any other source of uh, federal funding to help beef up that, that program? And I think that those are the kinds of questions that the community college is definitely exploring, Senator. Um, and I think that, you know, for, on our side of it, what we do is we, um, we work with our federal partners. We have not seen an uh, increase in the amount of funding available for job training yet, um, but we would hope that, um, as you've pointed out, the need is going to be significant and that if those resources are available, uh, we would be pursuing that avenue as well. trying to see. I thought there was one other question. This is Jay McCray. I had a question about just if you could describe, um, I have somebody where the response was there's a repair ticket in the works and could you just talk through somebody's stuck in the system and there's a repair ticket to get them unstuck. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Thank sure. You. Do you want to take it or do you want me to? <laughs> I think that, you know, I, I, one of the things that we've been talking about, particularly in the last week or so, is that um, frequently internal language is used to explain something to someone outside the department and it's, uh, in most cases, uh, at least as confusing as um, leaving people as confused as they were before they asked the question. And the whole um, uh, use of the word ticket has become one of those kind of shorthands for um, creating, uh, for, for answering a question without answering a question. Um, so a ticket is just um, a, uh, a request that is put to our technical unit. And the reason for that request could be a number of things. It could be um, a request because something needs to be researched so that staff can have um, additional training and information. It could be because they've identified a, uh, a process that's not working correctly or it could flag um, research that needs to happen because an individual's circumstance is unique and it is um, going to require some individual attention in order to have it resolved. So, yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is I view them as when someone who is in the claim center who is answering the, the 800 line when somebody calls in, it's their request for assistance because it's not something right. that they can fix while they're sitting with that person on the phone. Thank you, I appreciate that. Every profession has its jargon. And um, I would just say when I heard repair ticket, it sounded good. <laughs> so it wasn't a bad, it wasn't a bad oh, okay. part. I just wanted to understand it, thank you. Yeah, but basically it's a request for assistance from someone higher than the person who's answering right. the phone. Right. So some constituents appear to be reaching the end of their benefits. Will there be automatic extensions of benefits or if they used up the allowable amount, is that it regardless of the week? So 
So I think this is an it depends. Right. So um, the, the place that we're at is, you know, uh, regular unemployment benefits uh, last up to 26 weeks. After that, we've had um, a PEUC pandemic um, emergency unemployment compensation that added an additional 13 weeks on, so 39 weeks of benefits. And uh, we have triggered on to um, uh, extended benefits. The, the, our unemployment rate has, is high enough over a long enough period of time that the extended state extended benefit program, um, we're eligible to use that and um, we're working on having that in place um, very soon. And with that, you would have an additional 13 weeks of benefit. But if someone makes it through all of that, um, there, there is nothing um, in an unemployment insurance program beyond, beyond those weeks. So I think the question that I'm confused about is some, con some constituents have a zero maximum, uh, zero remaining balance of benefits that they're seeing. And so they're wondering if that means that's it, they're off. And I, I think it depends on whether they are on the state unemployment program or the, the PEUC, the, the extra 13 weeks that the commissioner talked about. If they're on state UI, uh, then the next step would be to go to the PEUC program. If they're on the PEUC program and they have the zero balance remaining, then the next step would be for us to move them into the extended benefits program. And will that happen or is automatically? The question? Yeah, will that oh. happen automatically through the computer? It will happen automatically uh, when they are when we are ready to move them into the extended benefits program. They will have a uh, some new questions come up on their uh, their weekly certification, just some basic questions that kicks off the process. Mm -hmm. And, and again, though, but, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, but but uh, typically. I mean, we say up to 26 weeks of benefits, mm -hmm. but not everyone is monetarily eligible for 26 weeks of Correct. benefits either. Correct. So I, I don't know if that's one of the categories that we're talking about, Senator. I don't know, Kim, if you wanted to elaborate on that at all. Uh, well, the, the number of weeks that somebody is eligible for for state unemployment depends on how much they earned in their base period, which is a certain time frame within the last 18 months. Um, and it, it, there is quite a, a formula in there, and I can't explain it off the top of my head, um, but it, it deals with the amount of earnings that were in that base period. So someone could be eligible, say, for only 20 weeks of state unemployment benefits instead of the 26. They would still be eligible for the PEUC 13 weeks because Congress enacted that to be 13 weeks regardless of earnings. Right. So that's the only point I wanted to raise, Senator, is that there is also that even though it's up to 26 weeks, depending on the amount of earnings, it may be shorter for individuals. Not everyone is guaranteed 26 weeks. And will PUA roll into the um, extended benefits if it's gone for the 13 weeks or whatever in the PUA? No. PUA is uh, available for 39 weeks. Mm -hmm. So that already has an additional 13 weeks in it. But they might run into that monetary eligibility. Like, would it cut them off earlier than 39 weeks? Is what no, I think. No, no, okay. no. Okay. 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 And the 39 weeks should run right up through the end of the, the right. calendar year. And again, yeah, because that's the that's the limiting factor on PUA is that um, unless Congress uh, takes other action, it ends in December. I think the week ending December 26th. Right. I don't know that 39 weeks goes exactly to the 26th, um, given that it started March 22nd, but it's within a week or two. Right. Okay, and the uh, question from Senator Millett. Uh, yeah, the Competitive Skills Scholarship Program is a Department of Labor program. 
and basically it's to provide funding um, for uh, education and it is uh, paid for with an assessment. Um, it's a partnership with employers um, and it's paid for uh, with an assessment on, uh, on employers who contribute to the Unemployment Insurance Trust Fund. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just pursue this offline just to get a little bit more information about the size and all of that. I really, sure. appreciate, I really appreciate the whole new, the whole new this is where education and labor crosses and I probably should know more than I do. Thank you. Complicated. Thank you. Are there other questions? If not, I don't see any other questions in here. So um, thank you everyone and uh, we'll keep you updated as um, we progress with the Lost Wage Assistance Program, as well as any other updates. Um, website will have FAQs on there and any information as soon as we get it. So thank you and have a great afternoon. Thank you.